so when we sing this out, I want to encourage you. Sing with everything you have. Jesus Christ put breath in your lungs to worship him. We get to worship him. So when it says, oh my soul, I'm going to give everything I have back to you, Jesus. Back to you, Jesus. Because when he died on the cross and he went to the grave and he rose again, it was in his name that he delivered you. He brought you freedom. And so we get to rejoice and rejoice. Even in difficult times, we get to rejoice. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Let's sing that out.
When the rain fell, when the floods came, when the wind blew, I was okay. You were right there. You're in every step I take. When the night falls, when my heart aches, if I stumble, I will not break. You'll be right there. You're in every step I take. Come on, let's stir it up this morning. When the rain
Jesus I'm never Sing that one more time. You are with me, Father. You for me. Why would I ever lack confidence when I have you? I'm never alone. I'm never abandoned. This fear never conquered me. Cause I belong to Jesus Fear never conquer me Cause I belong to Jesus One more time, fear Oh, fear never conquer me Cause I belong to Jesus We belong to the one who owns it all God is good this morning, amen and hey, this morning, as we take a seat and take a look at the screens, I just wanna remind you, God is with you, God is for you, and let's keep our hearts soft and our minds open to the message today, amen? Awesome, take a look at the screens this morning. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Hills Church. If you're new with us this morning, could you do us a favor, fill out the I'm New card in the seat pocket in front of you, and if you're online, go to hills.church slash new. It's just a tool for us to figure out how we can better serve you and figure out who you are. We want to know who's in our community. So let us know who you are so we can figure out how to connect with you. Yes. And today is actually Palm Sunday, which is so awesome. It is the kickoff of Holy Week and we are fully geared up for Easter. All week, follow along with us on social media. We will be putting out devos and other things for you to get your heart prepared for Easter. And with that, on Friday, we would love for you to join us for our Good Friday worship and prayer service. It's going to be an incredible contemplative service where we can just get our hearts set for Easter. Yes, and then following Good Friday, we have a packed Saturday and Sunday for you. Saturday starting off with our first Easter service, followed right afterwards by our Easter egg hunt. Now that is a fantastic time, but parents, don't worry about rushing down there. We have plenty of activities for you, for the kids, for the whole family. Plenty of Easter eggs to go around to all of the kids. So grab them, let's hang out, let's have a good time. Following the Easter egg hunt, we have our two Sunday morning services. We can't wait to spend Easter with you. Easter is such an incredible time to invite your friends, your family, your coworkers, your neighbors. So we want you to take advantage of this weekend. We have Easter invites ready for you in the seat pockets in front of you. There is nothing more powerful than a personal invite. So take advantage, grab those friends that you've been wanting to bring to church and let's pack out this room. We have so much that goes on here at Hills Church. If you wanna make sure you're not missing out, Please grab the handout in the lobby today. It will tell you all of the upcoming events that take place here at this amazing place that we get to call home. Church, let's jump back into service. Love it. How are we doing this morning? I know there's at least a few, a few men in the room who are dying inside because they're not watching Tiger Woods' final round. I may or may not be one of those, but man, I am excited to dive into God's Word with you today. And yes, today is Palm Sunday. It is the beginning of Holy Week. And as you heard on uh, the church news video, we are providing you guys with uh, a full week of just devotional readings and ways for you to enter into the story of the last week of Jesus's life. But before we dive into that, I need to, I really feel this deeply in my soul. I need to start by way of illustration. And because it's Master's Week, I got to start with a Master's illustration. And so Friends, if you're watching online, the audio is going to be muted for these clips. I'm sorry. I wish you were here with us. I know half of you are on the way to spring break somewhere. But I do want to say this. Man, stick with me to the very end. You'll see where this is going. Hopefully, you got to catch this moment live. But Rachel, let's go ahead and throw that first video up real quick. Stuart Singh, friends. Yeah. 
you almost got to roar with the crowd. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> You just get caught up in those moments. I'll never forget the one and only time I had the honor of going to the Masters. There is nothing like the roar of a crowd at, a, at Augusta National. It just echoes through the trees. But here's what was hilarious to me about this hole in one, okay? This was amazing. I want you to watch the flight path of this ball. We have another video. Check out the flight path of this ball. I promise it's the last one. There's just one more video I want to show you, okay? I'm just getting it in for you right now. I know you're missing it. All right, now look, the best though, the absolute best of this whole thing after I watched this happen live, they showed some video of Stuart Sink and his son, who is his caddy, walking off the tee box because neither of them thought the ball was going to go in the hole. So check out their reaction as they're walking off the tee box. It's pretty awesome, isn't it? <laughs> Let's give it up for Stuart Sink, man. I love it. I was sitting there thinking, and hey, just, just go with me. It might be a little bit of a stretch, but I do think it's important that we see this. From where that ball landed to where it ended was well over 20 feet. And that, that's how that green plays. At Augusta National, you know, man, you're not aiming at the flagstick. You're aiming at some slope somewhere on the green so the ball will eventually end up near the flagstick, near the pole. That's where you're going for. And what's crazy to me is this. Stuart Sink launched it where he's supposed to hit it. He knew it was a good shot, but he didn't think it was going to end up as a hole-in-one. He was walking off the tee box. They were casually watching it because all day long you had seen guys hit it right to that slope and lead it down to the pin. Now, what struck me was it did go in the hole. They flipped out. I love his son. He just paused and just went before he turned around and jumped on his dad. I mean, that was just such a cool moment. But there was a connection there that they didn't see coming. And that's the point I'm trying to make. From where the ball started to where the ball ended, there was a connection that was about to happen that they didn't realize was about to happen. In fact, they didn't believe it was going to happen because they're walking off the tee box. They're moving on. He's getting his putter out. He's ready to start putting, but the ball ended up in the hole. And here's what's fascinating to me. As I read and reread the story of Palm Sunday, which is the moment where Jesus enters the city of Jerusalem. After a few years of ministry where he gains notoriety, he gains a following, even towards the very end where he raises Lazarus from the dead. The people have heard of his fame. They've heard of his works. And now to fulfill prophecy, he is riding into the city on the foal of a donkey on Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week, the beginning of the end of Jesus's life. The beginning of the last seven days of Jesus' life. And as he is riding into the city, throngs of people, the crowds of people gather. And they lay palm branches in front of the colt as he's riding in. And they're shouting, they're singing to the top of their lungs. They're saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna, which means we praise you, right? Hosanna in the highest. And what's amazing to me is this. Many of those people in that crowd who just one week earlier were shouting Hosanna in the highest and giving praise to the name of Jesus were the very ones on Good Friday shouting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And my question is this. If you would have seen Palm Sunday, you would not, or would you have, had any clue where this thing was headed. If you were one of the followers of Jesus, you were excited. You're thinking, this is it. We've made it. We knew it all along. He's coming in. Everybody is naming him as Messiah. It's going to go down. He's going to overthrow religious leaders. He's going to overthrow government officials. He's going to start the uprising. This is the beginning. He's about to take his throne. 
And Jesus said, well, yeah, I am about to take my throne, but it's not the coronation that you're thinking of. It's not the coronation you're thinking of. I'm not going to take my throne in the way that you expect. And friends, what we have to see today is that Palm Sunday, where it started, ends in Good Friday. You don't have Good Friday without Palm Sunday. And Jesus did that intentionally. And I wanna, I wanna build that connection for you. I want you to see how these two things relate. And I want you to feel the weight of that for your own life, what that means for your own life. We've been in a series the past several weeks called The Real Jesus leading up to Easter. And the things that we've been looking at are these three words, kingdom, cross, and resurrection. Kingdom, cross, and resurrection. And, and here's, my, here's my thesis. Here's my big idea. You can't understand Jesus. You'll never understand the real Jesus unless you understand that he's the king of a kingdom, which we looked at a couple weeks ago on week one. We showed the story of the entire Bible, how, man, the kingdom of heaven has come to earth in Jesus and is coming again one day in full. You can't understand the real Jesus without understanding that he's the king of a kingdom. But you really can't understand the real Jesus unless you understand the cross that he died on. Why did he die on a cross? What was the purpose of the cross? What was happening on the cross? Did he know it was coming? This was the central part of who Jesus is. And here's how Paul put it in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1 to 2. Here's what he said to the church in Corinth. He says, when I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming to you the test, did I not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom? For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul is saying right here, look, I'm coming not with lofty speech or words of wisdom. I'm coming with one message, Jesus Christ crucified. I've got to explain that to you. That's got to land in your heart. That's got to go all the way down because that right there, friends, is the center point of it all. It's the reason he came. He was born to die. The cross is the point. Jesus' death and resurrection accomplished everything we need. There is nothing like it on planet Earth. There is no other religion even remotely close, no story that mankind has ever come up with. When you see this, it changes you. Paul says a few, chapter later, a few chapters later in 1 Corinthians, he says this, he says, what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, the most important thing, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So Paul says this, friends, the occurrences, the events of Easter weekend, the, uh, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, they are of first importance. They are the center point of our faith. Holy Week is the on-ramp to the most important time in history, literally the turning point in human history. We all love Christmas, don't we? Come on, give me an amen. You know you love some Christmas. We love Christmas, right? The sentimentality of it, the lights, all the things. I mean, everybody loves baby Jesus sent to save the world. How could you not love that, right? But if you haven't noticed, Easter is a little bit of a less, it's less of a big deal in our culture. Why? Because the cross and the resurrection confronts us. If you understand the cross, it calls everyone out. It says the reason there's a cross at the center point of our belief, the reason there's a cross at the center point of our faith is because you need saving and so do I. There's something that has gone so horribly wrong with the world. There is the reality of death reigning and people living in brokenness and wars and calamities and all these things that we can see all around us. And the cross is a statement that God has returned to rescue us and to fix things. It's the beginning of the restoration of all things, but it's also a statement 
about who we are and what we need. I love what John Stott says. This is a quote I came across this week. He says, Christianity is a rescue religion. It declares that God has taken the initiative. God acted for us in Jesus Christ to rescue us from sin and death. This is the primary theme of the whole Bible. It's the theme of the entire Bible. It's a rescue religion. Just to give you some verses to back it up, at the very beginning of Jesus's life, Matthew 1, 21, it says this, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save, he will rescue his people from their sins. Luke 19, 10, the son of man came to seek and save the lost. He came to rescue those who were lost. 1 Timothy 1.15, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, to save those who are broken and in need. 1 John 4.14, we have seen and testify that the Father sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Friends, Christianity at its core is a rescue religion. The good news of the gospel is that God has taken the initiative to rescue us. And, and how crazy is this? I thought about this. Every religion on planet earth, we know this, right? Has a symbol. Every religion on planet earth is associated with a symbol, some symbol or another. Um, if you think about it, well, I'll just th throw some of these up here, right? You have all these different symbols representing Islam, Taoism, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism. Uh, I forgot what this one was. But all these different religions have a symbol that represents some version of a core belief, some hero of their faith, some pathway to eternity. And here's what's amazing to me. When you think about the symbol of Christianity, it's a cross. It's, it's an instrument of Roman execution. And the symbol of our faith is not just a moon and a star. It's not just an abstract wheel or a word. It's God himself hanging on a cross for you and me. It's the center point of it all. And the question we have to ask ourselves is this. Why? What was the point of it all? You can't understand the real Jesus unless you understand the cross. And Jesus himself said, he said it himself in John 12, verse 27 to 33. He's about to go to the cross himself. And he says in John 27, 12, 27 to 33, he says, my soul is troubled. He said the same thing in the garden of Gethsemane. He goes, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Meaning, don't make me go to the cross. He's, he's saying, should I say that, Father? Should I say now, save me from this hour? And he goes, no. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. I was born for this. The cross is the point of it all. Me dying on the cross is the reason I'm here. And yes, friends, Easter is coming. If he doesn't rise from the dead, the cross is not vindicated. The cross has no meaning, but he did rise. So the cross is important. It says, for this reason, I have come. Jesus knew his purpose. He knew it from the very beginning. Think about this, John 1, 29. John the Baptist sees Jesus walking towards him. Uh, Pastor Dave did an amazing job at this last week talking about the moment when Jesus was baptized. And you can imagine the crowds and the throngs by the Jordan River. And John the Baptist sees Jesus through the crowds and he says, behold, look, everyone look. That's the one I've been telling you about. He's the Lamb of God sent to take away the sins of the world. He's the Lamb of God. What on earth does that mean? Everyone knew what lambs were for. They knew that a lamb was sacrificed every year, an unblemished lamb for the Passover feast. 
as a representative for God's uh, justice and wrath to pass over them so they could be set free. And here John the Baptist is declaring Jesus as a lamb sent from God. Because it would take a lamb sent from God to deal with the sins, not just of the Jewish people on the feast of Passover, but to deal with the sins of the entire world. From the very beginning, his purpose was clear. He's come to die. He's come to be the last and final Sacrifice, And as you think about it, Jesus came first as a lamb, but he will come again as a lion, as a leader of the tribes of the world, of the nations of the earth. He came first as a lamb to save the world. He will come again as a lion. So amazing to me, as you, as you think about this reality, did Jesus know why he was born? Did he know what he was here for? yes. Over and over again, yes. And the first time he begins to prophesy what's going to happen to him, this is phenomenal. It, it just, it's amazing the clarity with, with, with which he had. He was in Caesarea Philippi with his disciples. And he's in the midst of all these idols. It was a place where people came to worship all these different gods and goddesses. And in the midst of all these idols, he looked at his followers and he said, hey, Who do people say that I am? Well, some say a prophet, some say Elijah, some say you're a good teacher, Jesus. It's okay, who who do you say that I am? Peter, I love it, classic Peter. He says right there in verse 29, Mark 8, verse 29, he asked them, who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. You think Jesus had clarity on what was about to happen? This is months before he goes to the cross. Do you think he understood his purpose Do you think he understood what was coming? Listen to the clarity of that. The moment that Peter goes, you're God. You're the son of the living God. You're the Messiah sent to save us. He goes, you're right, Peter. And here's the plan. I'm gonna die. I'm gonna get handed over to to the authorities, to the chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, the elders. They're gonna kill me, but don't worry. I'm gonna rise again. He says it again, right? Right, literally one chapter later, later in Mark 9, verse 31. It says, Jesus continued to tell his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is going. Look, he's just clearly telling them, absolutely clear about it. The Son of Man, that's me, is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. They will kill me, okay? And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. So death is not final, Right? I'm going to come back to life. And then it says this. This is the key point. Let me imagine you listening to this. But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. Of course. Sounds like crazy talk. What, I mean, what if I came to you? I mean, now granted, I haven't walked on water or raised people from the dead or done a ton of miracles. But if anyone you know in your life came to you and said, hey, I'm about to be delivered over, killed, but don't worry, I'm going to come back from the dead you would have some trouble understanding that too. And that's one of the validations of Easter is that none of them actually believed it was gonna happen. None of them were waiting outside the tomb on the third morning counting down like, here we go, he's about to come back. That didn't happen. They were confused, but they didn't wanna ask him. So Jesus had absolute clarity over, hey, this is why I'm here. This is what's about to happen. And then right before Palm Sunday, Check this out. This is incredible. He says it again, right before he enters the city. He pulls his his friends, his closest disciples aside. He, He says, look, I'm about to go in, right? This is it. I understand what's about to happen. It's the beginning of the end. I'm about to kind of, you know, break the straw that broke the camel's back. This is about to happen. Here we go. He pulls them aside, Matthew 20. And as he was going up, verse 17, it'll be on the side screens. I want you to see this. As Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside, took them aside. 
And on the way, he said to them, see, he says it over and over again, see, we are going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes. They will condemn him to death, deliver him over to the Gentiles and be mocked and flogged and crucified and he will be raised on the third day. He has to say it to him over and over and over again. Guys, don't worry, it's part of the plan. Palm Sunday, what's about to happen, it's connected to Good Friday. From where the ball landed, you may not see where it's gonna end up, but I promise you, I know where it's going. I know where this thing is headed. So how do you get to Good Friday? Why the cross? What happened? Well, the Romans... The entire Roman authorities, the Roman Empire, for the most part, they stayed out of the picture with Jesus' life. He didn't seem like a threat to them. I mean, you, you see mainly Jesus in conflict throughout his entire ministry with who? Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, the elders. You don't hear much about Rome until the very end because Rome was the only one in that day with the power, the legal authority to crucify somebody. They were the only one that could do it. And so crucifixion was a powerful symbol. This is what N.T. Wright says, was a, was a powerful symbol throughout the Roman world. It was not just a means of crushing rebellions and striking fear into the hearts of anyone who would try to undermine the government. It did so with the maximum degradation and humiliation. So, Crucifixion was Rome's way of saying, we're in charge. We're the boss here. Nobody messes with us. If you think you're going to overthrow us, we're going to hang you on a cross outside the city gates and we're going to prove to everyone we still have the power. You're our property. We can do what we like with you and don't try to mess with us. Here was the problem for the Jews and this is what they knew. The problem for the Jews was this, the Jewish leaders. The Jewish leaders had to find a way to legally put Jesus to death. They couldn't crucify him on their own. They had to convince Pilate that Jesus was a political threat to Rome. That's why they needed Rome. That's why they needed Pilate to agree with them. John 19.31, I'll just read this verse for us to clarify. It says this, Pilate said to them, after Jesus goes through six different trials, okay, on Good Friday. Chapter 19, verse 31 of the Gospel of John, Pilate said to them, hey, you take him yourselves and you judge him by your own law. This has nothing to do with Rome. This is between you and him. This is a religious, you know, spat between different factions of Judaism. But the Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. We can't do what we need to do with him. We need to kill him. And from that point on, you see Pilate trying to get out of the situation, trying to back out of the situation. So look, you may ask, well, who, who killed Jesus? Well, the Romans did. Because the Romans were the one with the authority to put someone to death by crucifixion. Well, how did we get to that point, right? What's the connection between Palm Sunday and Good Friday? Why? Did the Jewish leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees, why did they want Jesus dead? Why? Well, for one reason, they were jealous of him. In fact, I think there were three reasons they wanted Jesus dead. They were jealous, he claimed to be God, and he exposed them. They were jealous, he claimed to be God, and he exposed them. John eleven forty seven 47 to 48, it says at the very end, this, if we let him go on like this in verse 48, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Two key words in there. Scribes and the Pharisees are absolutely terrified. This guy has influence. He has power. He has a following. Everyone's following Jesus. They're not coming to the scribes or the Pharisees anymore for religious approval for religious uh, favor with God, they're coming to Jesus. And he goes, look, if we don't deal with this guy, Rome is gonna come and they're gonna remove us and, and we're gonna lose our nation and our place with Rome. They think Israel belongs to them. 
They want power, they want influence, and they are jealous because Jesus is taking their place in their nation. We're the ones in charge, they say. We have the place of honor. We have the power and the respect, and he is not going to take it from us. Number two, he claimed to be God. John 10, 33. We are not stoning you for any good work, they replied. This is one of the earlier times they tried to kill him. But for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. You're claiming to be God. That's not okay with us. But number three, and this might be the biggest one, Jesus exposed the Pharisees. And stick with me here. Um, you ever, I remember, I'll never forget this. I had to take AP, I didn't have to. I took AP calculus in high school. Worst decision of my life. Maybe some of you destroyed that class. What didn't go great for me. But I was already into the University of Georgia at that point, so I'd, I didn't have too much motivation to like really lean in. That being aside, um, I'll never forget maybe the second or third exam in that class, you know, everyone bombed it. It wasn't just me. Everyone, I think the highest grade in the class was a 68. Truly a 68. Except for one guy, Dan Bach. I'll never forget this guy. He was a genius, like Bach. Like, you know, it sounds like a symphony composer right there. He got a 1600 on the SAT. He got into MIT. I think he works for the CIA now. He's gone dark for years. No one knows what he's doing. But he was next level genius. I am not exaggerating when I say this. His lowest grade on any assignment in AP Calculus was a 99. And so the whole class gets a 68. And we're like, teacher, can you please just grade on a curve for us? We, we all need about 20 points, okay? <laughs> all of us, just, just for any of us to have a chance. And she's like, well, I would, except for Dan Bach. And we're like, Dan, we are gonna crucify you. You've gotta get out of this class. We're like, Dan doesn't count. He's a robot. He's a machine. He is not a human. Like, he's a computer. And, uh, you know, so she would, she would remove Dan's scores frequently as an outlier. We all knew he was. And she would frequently grade on a curve. Here's the deal. The Pharisees and everybody kind of thinks or thought that God grades on a curve, right? And the Pharisees were like, hey, we're the standard of that curve. You know, we, we're at like 100%. The rest of you all, you need some help. Maybe we'll give you a few extra points here or there, but we have the power. We're the standard. We're the ones who are righteous and holy before God. And if you want to get right with God, you better listen to us. You better follow us. We are Dan Bach. We are the ones that have all the answers, that have the power. And if you want to get into heaven, do what we say. Make sure you're in right standing with us if you want to be in right standing with God. And then Jesus comes along and says something slightly offensive Hey, if anybody wants a shot at the kingdom of heaven, you better be way better than those guys. Your righteousness better exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. In fact, Jesus broke the curve. He came in and called them out over and over again. He goes, look, murder is not just about not killing someone. It's about not even being angry in your heart. Adultery is not just about not sleeping with somebody who's not your spouse. It's about not even looking or desiring somebody who's not your spouse. The standard of God is so far above anything that humans are able to achieve on their own. Jesus comes in and he exposes the Pharisees. And at every single turn, he's doing it over and over again. In fact, after Palm Sunday, after the triumphal entry, he goes into the temple and he overturns the money changers. He overturns all the merchants who are taking advantage of people so that they can fleece their own pockets and also pay the scribes and the Pharisees and the chief priests on the side. Jesus goes, no, you've turned my father's house into a den of robbers. It's meant to be a house of prayer. So he's calling them out left and right. The next day he comes in and he spends basically three chapters teaching. And almost every single parable, every single teaching is against the chief priests, the scribes, and the Pharisees. Friends, think about this. Jesus is going for it. The reason he told his disciples, hey, it's about to go down. It's all about to go down. I'm going in on the triumphal entry. People are going to say things about me that they don't like. They're going to praise me as God and as the Messiah. 
I'm gonna go in there, flip over tables. I'm gonna make them real mad. Then the next day, I'm gonna go for the jugular. Here's what he says on the next day. He goes through almost 40 verses. The seven woes of the scribes and Pharisees. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You're fake you think you're setting the, the curve. You think you're setting the standard of righteousness, not even close. You're fake. You shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. You block people from my kingdom. He calls them hypocrites. He says they shut up the kingdom of God instead of opening the doorway for people to come in. He goes, neither do you enter in nor those who follow you. Those are fighting words for Pharisees right there. He called them, among other things, children of hell. That's a big one. Said they were like the blind leading the blind, whitewashed tombs, like you're a really pretty grave. Uh, a brood of vipers and their entire lives they have spent killing the messengers of God. You ever seen like an actual fight, two people in conflict? It always starts with words, right? Some words said back and forth. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> then the guy comes back. Blah, blah, blah. They get a little closer to each other. Oh, yeah, well, blah, blah. you know, I don't know what they're saying, but it, it gets a little louder. And then someone goes, well, your mom or whatever, right? And when, you know, if you bring the mom into it, it's pretty much like, okay, blows are coming next. It's gonna get there, right? So Jesus, instead of backing down, instead of like pulling, you know, hitting the, the brakes a little bit, I can imagine the disciples being like, ooh, ooh Jesus, ooh, probably not, don't go, uh, uh. And then he just goes there and they're like, uh, okay, there's no helping him at this point. Like, it's over, right? Jesus immediately, at the end of this whole section, he pulls his, his disciples aside, says this, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples, you know, that after two days, the Passover is coming. Been teaching here for days. I've been, I've been coming against these guys for days. In two days, the Passover is coming. The Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. I did this on purpose. I, I, I kicked the hornet's nest. I poked the beehive. Friends, Palm Sunday is leading to Good Friday. It must end in Good Friday. Jesus goes, don't you get it, friends? This is why I've come. I was the Lamb of God sent to take away the sins of the world. I have to do this for you. No one's forcing me. I'm choosing it of my own accord. Jesus had to push the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees far enough to know that they would do anything it took to get him crucified. He had to push them so far knowing there's now no turning back because they would have to go before Pilate and get this execution legalized. And so that's what they did. Jesus was presented to Pilate. You know the story. Pilate says, I find nothing wrong with him. Take him back. They're like, nope, you gotta kill him. He's like, nope, take him back. They're like, nope, you gotta kill him. Nope, take him back. So finally, he has him flogged with a lead-tipped whip. The soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head and they put a purple robe on him. Hail, king of the Jews. They mocked and they slapped and they spit him. They spit on him. Pilate presented Jesus to them. He said, is this enough? Y'all satisfied yet? They said, no, you have to kill him. You have to crucify him. It goes on. When they saw him in verse six, 19.6, the leading priests and the temple guards began shouting, crucify him, crucify him. They said, we have a law and according to our law, he must die for he's claimed to be God. Pilate's getting a little bit antsy here. He takes Jesus back into his quarters. And I'll just imagine this, this man who's been whipped and flogged, standing in front of Pilate with a crown of thorns and a robe on his back. And Pilate looks at him. And he says to Jesus, he took Jesus back into the headquarters again and he asked him, where are you from? But Jesus did not answer. And he says, why don't you talk to me? Why don't you talk to me? Pilate demanded, don't you realize I have the power to release you or crucify you? Your life is on the line, man. 
Just say the word, I'll get you out of here. I don't think you're guilty. At every turn, Jesus could have hit the brakes, hit the eject button. He says to him, you have no power over me unless it were given to you from above. So the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Pilate, Jesus is saying, it's not about you, man. It's not even about Rome. It's not about the reasons why the Jewish people have brought me here to kill me. All of this is a part of God's bigger plan. I am the lamb of God sent to take away the sins of the world. And then the Jewish leaders, they put the nail in the coffin. Here's, listen to what they said to Pilate to push him over the edge. I'm closing with this so the band can come out. Pilate tried to release him, tried again to release him, verse 12, but the Jewish leaders shouted, if you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who declares himself a king is a rebel against Caesar. Pilate, it's either gonna be him hanging on the cross or you. Because if you don't hang him on the cross, we're gonna go to Caesar and tell Caesar there's a guy claiming to be king of the world and Pilate just let him go. So immediately Pilate sat down on the judgment seat and sentenced Jesus to be crucified. Both parties knew that Jesus was not guilty of the charge, a political rebel against Rome. Both parties knew he wasn't guilty of that charge and yet that's why he was hung on a cross. but I want to say this so clearly as I close. The Roman reasons, Pilate's reasons for killing Jesus, they don't matter. All the Jewish reasons, all the reasons of the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees for killing Jesus, they don't matter. Why? Because Jesus said himself, in John 10, 17, the reason my father loves me is that I laid down my own life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me. No one takes my life. I have the authority to lay it down and the authority to take it up again. Friends, Romans three twenty five says this, God put Christ forward as a payment for our sins. Not Rome, not the chief priests, God put himself forward for the payment of our sins. Friends, if you wanna know the real Jesus, if you wanna see how this whole thing comes together, you have to see the cross. You cannot understand Jesus without understanding why his life ended with death on a cross. If you really wanna know what God is like, if you really wanna understand the God of the Bible, you have to look at the cross because right there on the cross, it says, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. Healing the divide of separation between us and God. Making a way for us to be adopted into the family of God. Making a way for forgiveness and mercy and grace to come to each one of us because payment had to be made. There needed to be a lamb from heaven that would take away the sins of the world and begin the restoration of all things. Friends, the cross is the ultimate picture of God's love, his nature and character, his justice against evil. It's the reason that we can be healed and forgiven. It's the beginning of the end of sin and death. Who killed Jesus? No one. He laid down his life freely as the final act in the rescue, as the final act in the rescue of the world. And not even death could keep him dead. And that's the story, friends. That's what we are celebrating and entering into this week. As we take communion together now, my prayer for you is that the reality of the cross will begin to sink deeper and deeper into your soul. Let's take communion together. I'll pray for us and we'll take communion together. Lord, thank you for the cross. Thank you, Lord, for what you did for us. The symbol, the centerpiece of our faith. And right now, Father, I'm asking in Jesus' name that this week 
what you did for us with all the drama, all the, all the different things happening from Rome to the chief priests and the elders, Lord, it was all for love. Let this be real to us in Jesus' name, amen. Let's take communion together. Friends, would you stand with me? This is good news. Palm Sunday is good news. People often ask, what is Easter? What is the big deal this week? Why is Holy Week so important? And as Jesus enters into town and we begin to gaze upon Good Friday, the day of his his crucifixion, and then we look to Easter, the day of his resurrection, Every movement of this week is a celebration of good news for you and I, for your families, your loved ones, the the pain that you know in this world, all of those things we bring to the table of Jesus, to Easter, to the celebration of defeat. And so right now, I just wanna encourage you guys to, to invite people to experience good news this week with us. We've got, uh, we've got invite signs for your front lawns uh, in the lobby. Grab one of those on your way out. A great way to, to let people who are walking by your house know that they can maybe attend an Easter service with you. We've got in the kids building, parents, we've got these Easter egg invite kits that you can grab on your way out. It's a chance for you and your kids to go egg a lawn nearby with fun Easter eggs and an invitations within them to join your family for Easter. We want to have some fun. We want to get creative at bringing good news to a world and a culture in need of some good news. Amen. And so Lord, would you bless us as we prepare to leave this place? God, would you bless us as we enter this holy week? And Lord, for any man or woman in this room right now, Lord, who who is asking, Lord, for some breakthrough this week, for an encounter of good news in their own lives, God, I pray that you would meet them in the days that lead up to Good Friday and Easter this week. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you for what we get to celebrate as a church family in this season. It's in your name we pray together, amen. All right, friends, we love you. We'll talk to you soon.